Section 23 of The Living Animals of the World, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stephen Winterburn. The Living Animals of the World, Volume 1, Mammals, by Charles Lewis Cornish, Editor. Domestic Dogs, by C. H. Lane. The dog, almost without exception, shows a marked liking for the society of human beings, and adapts itself to their ways more than any other animal. Fox, stag, and hare hounds, the latter better known as harriers and beagles, have many points in common, much beauty of shape and color, and great suitability for their work, though differing in some other particulars. Another group, greyhounds, whippets, Irish wolfhounds, Scottish deerhounds, all of which come under the category of gaze hounds, or those which hunt by sight, are built for great speed to enable them to cope with the fleet game they pursue. In the same group should be included the borzoi, or Russian wolfhound, now very popular in this country, with something of the appearance of the Scottish deerhound about it as to shape, but with a finer, longer head, deeper body, more muscular limbs, and shaggier in the hair on body and tail. The otter hound is one of the most picturesque of all the hound tribe. This variety somewhat reminds one of a large and leggy dandy Dinmont Terrier, with a touch of the bloodhound, and is thought to have been originally produced from a cross between these or similar varieties. The bloodhound is another, with much style and beauty of shape, color, and character about it, which cannot fail to favorably impress any beholder. The matches or trials which have of late years been held in different localities have been most interesting in proving its ability for tracking footsteps for long distances, merely following them by scent, some time after the person hunted started on the trail. By the kindness of my friend Mr. E. Bruff, I am able to give as an illustration a portrait of what he considers the best bloodhound ever bred. Much valued by sportsmen with the gun are pointers, so called from their habit of remaining in a fixed position when their quarry is discovered, eagerly pointing in its direction until the arrival of the guns. They are most often white with liver, lemon, or black markings, but occasionally self-colors, such as liver or black, are met with. They have been largely bred in the west of England, I have been fortunate in obtaining one of Mr. E. C. Norrish's celebrated strain as a typical specimen for illustration. The setter group, which comprises three varieties, are all useful and beautiful in their way. The English are usually white, with markings or tickings of blue, lemon, or black. They are rather long and narrow in the head, with bodies and sterns well feathered, and are graceful and active movers. Gordon setters, which are always black and tan in color, and preferred without any white, are generally larger and stronger in build than the last named. Irish setters are more on the lines of the English, being a rich tawny red in color, rather higher on the leg, with narrow skulls, glossy coats, feathered legs and stern, ears set low and lying back, and lustrous expressive eyes. Retrievers may be divided into flat-coated and curly-coated. Both are usually black, but other colors are occasionally seen. The coats of the first named are full, but without curl in them, while the latter have their bodies, heads, legs, thighs, and even tails covered with small, close curls. The eyes of both should be dark, and the ears carried closely to the sides of the head. In an article dealing with retrievers, which appeared in the Cornhill magazine under the title of Dogs Which Earn Their Living, the author writes, There is not the slightest doubt that in the modern retrievers' acquired habits, certainly one acquired habit, that of fetching dead and wounded game, are transmitted directly. The puppies sometimes retrieve without being taught, though with this they also combine a greatly improved capacity for further teaching. Recently, a retriever was sent after a winged partridge which had run into a ditch. 
The dog followed it some way down the ditch and presently came out with an old rusty tea kettle held in its mouth by the handle. The kettle was taken from the dog amid much laughter. Then it was found that inside the kettle was the partridge. The explanation was that the bird, when wounded, ran into the ditch which was narrow. In the ditch was the old kettle with no lid on. Into this the bird crept. And as the dog could not get the bird out, it very properly brought out the kettle with the bird in it. Among dogs which earn their living, these good retrievers deserve a place in the front rank. The illustration shows a good flat-coated retriever at work. The spaniel group is rather large, including the English and Irish water spaniels, the former an old-fashioned useful sort, often liver or roan, with some white or other markings, and a good deal of curl in the coat and on the ears. His Irish brother is always some shade of liver in color, larger in the body and higher on the leg, covered with a curly coat, except on the tail, which is nearly bare of hair, with a profusion of hair on the top of the head, often hanging down over the eyes, giving a comical appearance, and increasing his Hibernian expression. They make lively affectionate companions and grand assistants at waterfowl shooting. Clumber spaniels are always a creamy white, with lemon or light tan markings, and are rather slow and deliberate in their movements, but have a stylish, high-class look about them. Sussex spaniels are also rather heavy in build and of muscular frame, but can do a day's work with most others. They are a rich copper red in color, with low short bodies, long feathered ears, full eyes of deep color, and are very handsome. Black spaniels should be glossy raven black in color, with strong muscular bodies on strong short legs, long pendulous ears, and expressive eyes. Good specimens are in high favor and command long prices. I regret I cannot find room for an illustration of this breed so deservedly popular. Cockers, which are shorter in the back, higher on the leg, and lighter in weight, being usually under 25 pounds, are very popular, full of life, and very attractive in appearance. Basset hounds, both rough and smooth-coated, are probably the most muscular dogs in existence of their height, with much dignity about them. In the sporting teams at the Royal Agricultural Hall, there were some 13 or 15 teams of all kinds of sporting dogs, and of these, a team each of rough and smooth bassets was in the first four. Dachshunds are often erroneously treated as sporting dogs. There are certainly not so many supporters of the breed as formerly. Their lean heads with long hanging ears, long low bodies, and crooked forelegs give them a quaint appearance. The colors are usually shades of chestnut red or black and tan, but some are seen chocolate and dappled, which is one shade of reddish brown, with spots and blotches of a darker shade all over it. Great Danes, though mostly classed amongst non-sporting dogs, have much of the hound in their bearing and appearance. The whole-colored are not so popular as the various shades of Brindle and Harlequin, but I have seen many beautiful fawns, blues, and other whole colors. They are being bred with small natural drooping ears. One of the first I remember seeing exhibited was a large Harlequin belonging to the late Mr. Frank Adcock with the appropriate name of Satan, as, although always shown muzzled, he required the attentions of three or four keepers to deal with him. And at one show I attended, he overpowered his keepers, got one of them on the ground, tore his jacket off, and gave him a rough handling. Non-Sporting Varieties St. Bernard's, although sometimes exceeding three feet at the shoulder, are as a rule very docile and good-tempered, and many are owned by ladies. The coat may be rough or smooth, according to taste, but either are splendid animals. They are sometimes seen self-colored, but those with markings, shades of rich red with white and black for preference, are the handsomest. They are still used as first aids in the snow on the Swiss mountains. So far as I remember, this is the only breed of dog used for stud and exhibition for which as much as 1,500 pounds has been paid. 
and this has occurred on more than one occasion. Newfoundlands have regained their place in popularity, and many good blacks and black and whites can now be seen. Numerous cases are on record of their rendering aid to persons in danger of drowning, and establishing communication with wrecked vessels on the shore. Mastiffs are looked on as one of the national breeds. Their commanding presence and stately manner make them highly suitable as guards, and they are credited with much attachment and devotion to their owners. The colors are mostly shades of fawn with black muzzle, or shades of brindle. I am able to give the portrait of one of the best specimens living, belonging to Mr. R. Ledbetter. Bulldogs are also regarded as a national breed. They are at present in high favor. The sizes and colors are so various that all tastes can be satisfied. Recently there has been a fancy for toy bulldogs, limited to 22 pounds in weight, mostly with upright ears of tulip shape. In spite of the many aspersions on their character, bulldogs are usually easy-going and good-tempered, and are often very fastidious feeders, what fanciers call bad doers. Rough collies are very graceful, interesting creatures, and stand first in intelligence amongst canines. They are highly popular. Several have been sold for over 1,000 pounds, and the amounts in prize money and fees obtained by some of the cracks would surprise persons not in the fancy. A high-bred specimen, in coat, is most beautiful. The colors most favored are sables with white markings, but black, white, and tans, known as tricolors, are pleasing and effective. I quite hoped to give a portrait of one of the most perfect of present-day champions, belonging to Her Highness the Princess de Montglion, but could not find room. Smooth Collies are a handsome breed, full of grace, beauty, and intelligence, and very active and lively. A favorite color is Merle, a sort of lavender, with black markings and tan and white in parts, usually associated with one or both eyes china-colored. Specimens often win in sheepdog trials. A bitch of mine won many such, and was more intelligent in other ways than many human beings. Old English sheepdogs are a most fascinating breed, remarkably active, possessed of much endurance and resource, and very faithful and affectionate. I have often made long journeys through cross-country roads accompanied by one or more of them, and never knew them miss me, even on the darkest night or in the crowded streets of a large town. The favorite color is pigeon blue, with white collar and markings. The coat should be straight and hard in texture. The illustration is from a portrait of one of the best bitches ever shown, belonging to Sir H. de Trafford. Dalmatians are always white, with black liver or lemon spots the size of a shilling or less, evenly distributed over the body, head, ears, and even tail, and pure, without mixture of white. There is much of the pointer about this variety, which has long been used for sporting purposes on the continent of Europe. I can testify to their many good qualities as companions and house dogs. To quote again from the article above mentioned, it is commonly believed that the spotted carriage dogs once so frequently kept in England were about the most useless creatures of the dog kind, maintained only for show and fashion. This is a mistake. They were used at a time when a traveling carriage carried, besides its owners, a large amount of valuable property, and the dog watched the carriage at night when the owners were sleeping at country inns. We feel we owe an apology to the race of carriage dogs. While this dog is becoming extinct in spite of his useful qualities, other breeds are invading spheres of work in which they had formerly no part. There is only one point in which I differ from the above, and that is contained in the last sentence. There are a number of enthusiastic breeders very keen on reviving interest in this variety, and I have, during the last few years, had large entries to judge so that we shall probably see more of them in the future. Poodles are of many sizes and colors. They are very intelligent, easily taught tricks, and much used as performing dogs. They have various kinds of coats. Corded, in which the hair hangs in long strands or ringlets. Curly, 
with a profusion of short curls all over them, something like retrievers, and fluffy, when the hair is combed out to give much the appearance of fleecy wool. A part of the body, legs, head, and tail is usually shorn. Bull terriers are now bred with small, natural drooping ears and should have long, wedge-shaped heads, fine coats, and long tails. There is also a toy variety, which hitherto has suffered from round skulls and tulip ears, but is rapidly improving. I have bred many as small as three pounds in weight. In each variety, the color preferred is pure white, without any markings, and with fine tapering tails. Irish Terriers are very popular, and should be nearly wholly red in color, with long lean heads, small drooping ears, hard coats, not too much leg, and without coarseness. They make good comrades. Bedlington Terriers have long been popular in the extreme north of England, and are another fighting breed. It is indeed often difficult to avoid a difference of opinion between show competitors. Their lean, long heads, rather domed skulls with top knot of lighter hair, long pointed ears, and small dark eyes give them a peculiar appearance. The coats, which are linty in texture, should be shades of blue or liver. Three breeds, all more or less hard in coat texture and grizzled in color on heads and bodies, while tanned on other parts, are Airedale, Old English, and Welsh Terriers which may be divided into large, medium, and small. The first named make very good all-round dogs. The Old English, less in number, make useful dogs and are hardy and companionable. While Welsh Terriers are much the size of a small, wire-haired Fox Terrier, but usually shorter and somewhat thicker in the head. I intended one of Mr. W.S. Glynn's best dogs to illustrate the last named. Fox Terriers are both smooth and wire-haired. Their convenient size and lively temperament make them very popular as pets and companions for both sexes and all ages. The color is invariably white, with or without markings on head or body, or both. Black and tan and white English Terriers are built upon the same lines, differing chiefly in color, the former being raven black with tan markings on face, legs, and some lower parts of the body, and the latter pure white all over. Both should have small natural drooping ears, fine glossy coats, and tapering sterns. The toy variety of the former should be a miniature of the larger, and is very difficult to produce of first-class quality. Scottish Terriers are very interesting, often with much character about them. The usual colors are black, shades of gray or brindle, but some are seen fawn, stone color, and white. The ears should be carried bolt upright, the coat as hard as a badger's, teeth even, small dark expressive eyes, four legs straight, the back short. One I brought from Skye many years since I took with me when driving some miles into the country. Coming back by a different route, he missed me. But on nearing my starting point I found him posted at a juncture of four roads, by one of which I must return. He could not have selected a better position. The illustration is that of a first-rate specimen of the variety, Champion Balmacron Thistle. Dandy Dinmont Terriers have many quaint and charming ways. They are very strongly built, being among the most muscular of the Terriers, of high courage, devotedly attached to their owners, and admirably adapted for companions, being suitable for indoors or out, and at home anywhere. The colors are pepper, a sort of darkish iron gray, and mustard, a yellowish red fawn. Both with white silky hair on head, called the top knot, and lustrous dark eyes, very gypsy-like and independent in expression. Skies, both prick and drop-eared, are another Scottish breed which well deserve their popularity, as they are thorough sporting animals. The colors are chiefly shades of dark or light grey, but sometimes fawn with dark points and whites are seen. The texture of coat should be hard and weather-resisting, the eyes dark and keen in expression. Bodies long, low, and well-knit. Legs straight in front, even mouths, tails carried gaily but not curled over the back. 
Skipper keys are of Belgian origin. To those who do not know them, they are something like medium-sized Pomeranians, short of coat but without tails. They are nearly always pure black in color, with coats of hardish texture, fullest round the neck and shoulders, the ears standing straight up like darts, short cobby bodies, and straight legs. They make smart guards and companions. Chows originally came from China, but are now largely bred here. They are square-built, sturdy dogs, with dense coats, tails carried over the side, blunt pointed ears, and rather short, thick heads. They have a little of a large, coarse Pomeranian, with something of an Eskimo about them, but are different from either, with a type of their own. The color is usually some shade of red or black, often with a bluish tinge in it. One marked peculiarity is that the tongues of Chows are blue-black in color. Pomeranians can be procured of any weight from 3 to 30 pounds, and of almost every shade of color. At present, brown of various shades is much in favor, but there are many beautiful whites, blacks, blues, sables, and others. They are very sharp and lively, and make charming pets and companions. Really good specimens command high prices. The illustration is of one of the best of his color ever seen, Champion Pippin. Pugs, both fawn and black, are old-fashioned favorites, very quaint and peculiar in appearance. They should have square heads and muzzles, with small ears, large protruding eyes, short thick bodies, and tails tightly curled over the back. The illustration, Duchess of Connaught, is of a well-known winner. Maltese terriers are very beautiful when purebred. They have a long, straight coat of silky white hair nearly reaching the ground, black nose and eyes, and the tail curled over the back of their short cobby body. Their beauty well repays the trouble of keeping them in good condition. The illustration, from a photograph taken for this article, is that of the high-class dog, Santa Claus. Yorkshire Toy Terriers, with their steel-blue bodies and golden-tanned faces, legs, and lower parts, and long, straight coats, require skillful attention to keep in order, but are very attractive as pets. Toy Spaniels are very old members of the toy division, dating from or before the time of His Majesty King Charles. King Charles Spaniels being black and tan, Prince Charles Spaniels black, white, and tan. Another strain, the Blenheim, white with shades of reddish tan markings on the head and body, and a spot of same color on forehead, and the ruby, a rich coppery red all over. They should be small and stout in size and shape, without coarseness, long in the ear, with large full protruding eyes of dark color, a short face, a straight coat, and not leggy. Japanese Spaniels carry heavy coats, usually black or yellow and white in color, shorter in the ears, which are carried more forward than in the last named, broader in the muzzle, with nearly flat faces, dark eyes, and bushy tails carried over the back. They have very short legs, and their hair nearly reaches the ground as they walk. When I kept them, they were much larger in size, but they are often now produced under six pounds in weight. Pekin Spaniels, the last of the toy Spaniels I need mention, come from China. They should have soft fluffy coats, tails inclined to turn over the back, short faces, broad muzzles, large lustrous eyes, and a grave dignified expression. The color is usually some shade of tawny fawn or drab, but I have seen them black and dark brown. Whatever color, it should be without white. The illustration, Mrs. Lindsay's Tartan Plaid, was one of the early importations. Italian Greyhounds, another old-fashioned variety of toy dog, should not exceed 12 pounds in weight, but in my opinion are better if they are some pounds less. Much like miniature Greyhounds in shape and build, they are elegant, graceful little creatures, very sensitive to cold. Shades of fawn, cream, or French grey are most common, but some are slate blue, chestnut red, and other tints. Of late years, the breed has met with more encouragement, and there is less fear of its being allowed to die out. 
Griffon's Bruxellois have been greatly taken up the last few years. They are something like Yorkshire toy terriers in size and shape, but with a shortish, harsh coat, generally of some shade of reddish brown, very short face, small shining dark eyes, heavy underjaw, short thick body, and an altogether comical appearance. Imported specimens, particularly before reaching maturity, are often difficult to rear. The African sand dog, occasionally seen in this country, mostly at shows, is remarkable for being entirely hairless except a few hairs of a bristly character on the top of the head and a slight tuft at the end of the tail. It is chiefly blue-black or mottled in color, something in shape and size like a coarse black and tan terrier, and very susceptible to cold. Having been supplied with an illustration of pariah puppies, I will say a few words about this variety, which is seen in large numbers at Constantinople and other eastern cities, where they roam about unclaimed, and act as amateur scavengers. They are said to divide the places they inhabit into districts or beats, each with its own leader, and resent any interference with their authority. I have known cases where they have made a determined attack on travelers out late at night, but they are rather a cowardly race and easily repulsed with a little firmness on the part of the attacked. Probably these are the descendants of the dogs so often mentioned in scripture with opprobrium. And among Eastern peoples, to call a man a dog is even now the most insulting epithet that can be used. By the Jews in ancient times, the dog never seems to have been used, as with us, in hunting and pursuing game and wild animals, but merely as a guardian of their flocks, herds, and sometimes dwellings. End of section 23. Recording by Stephen Winterburn.